Alright, Pop Pickers, it's time to delve into the pages of Sega Power for the worst reviewed games for the Master System from the September of 1993. Pluck straight from the pages of the Hard Line section, I'll take the look at the games that offended Sega Power's reviewers enough to earn the dreaded one star rating. But were they really that crap? Did they deserve their abysmal scores? Or were they just misunderstood? Well, let's find out. And let's check out the Master System's Top of the Flops. Bravely attempting to combine flight simulation with action shooter and failing miserably, here's Ace of Aces. The premise alone should have been a winner. You're a World War II pilot on daring missions, dogfighting and bombing your way to allied victory. However, it lets itself down in a massive way. It has hideous graphics, turgid controls and way overcomplicated sim elements, making this an experience you would sooner forget. Released relatively late on in the Master System's life cycle, it has absolutely no excuse looking as vomitous as it does, nor should it be as awful to control. Had they decided to go with just the one genre, this may have been playable, but instead this only highlights the limitations of the 8-bit console. Richly deserves its tragic low score. Based on a once popular sitcom that was near the end of its heyday by this game's release, ALF is possibly one of the worst games ever committed to cartridge. You take control of the titular alien protagonist and embark on a quest to repair his crashed spaceship, while avoiding capture by sinister looking dudes in flasher coats. The already gimped controls are marred by a painful jump mechanic and a hitbox the size of a f***ing house. You'll get bored of being repeatedly killed by motorcycles from way across the other side of the street before you manage to figure out what you're actually supposed to be doing. It's ironic that the format bears a striking similarity to Atari's infamous E.T. and we all know what happened there, and frankly, this game deserves to be buried in the desert along with it. Here's a two-for-one deal in utter crap. Inevitable for the day, the classic movie trilogy Back to the Future gets the customary licensed game treatment. You will notice that part one is missing from this, and that's because it never existed. But that's fine, because two terrible games are plenty. Both titles are just compilations of NAF minigames that tenuously connect to the film's plot, and the result for both of them is a confused, boring mess. Once again, the barely existent gameplay is hamstrung by poor physics, such as in the highly frustrating skateboarding section. The graphics stick out for their awfulness, and the less said about the ear-assaultingly terrible music, the better. Now at least Back to the Future 3 looks a bit nicer, save for this utterly haunting image of Doc Brown. But the shoddy gameplay remains. Nothing about these games is at all pleasant. If I had Doc Brown's DeLorean, I'd use it to go back in time to stop these abominable games from ever seeing the light of day. Champions of Europe is one of gaming's great gaffes. It's blatantly an unfinished game, lacking music or sound effects, and sporting some utterly broken gameplay mechanics. Players can't hold onto the ball worth a toffee, Fouls frequently go unpunished, and most notoriously, you can score by simply hoofing the ball into your own team's net. Look, I'm not much of a footy fan, but I'm fairly sure that's not how it works. And it looks terrible as well. I know 8-bit graphics are limited, but whoever made this map of the world here just obviously drew it from memory and failed. It's all made even more dismal by the fact that this was actually supposed to be the official game of the UEFA Championship of 1992. UEFA actually signed off on this piece of crap. Avoid like the proverbial plague. As the name suggests, this is a World Cup tournament, and this time it sports a side-on perspective, which gives it a nice bit of realism. The controls are tight and give you reasonable control of your team, with only the occasional hiccups. There are a few irritating snags that let it down though. The sound design is obnoxious. Lots of jarring shrieks and whistles issue forth from the sound chip, which is really distracting. And there's far too much sprite tearing on the screen, which really helps in the thick of the action. There are no free kicks or penalties, surely a vital part of the game of football. And goal detection is disgusting. Look here, the computer actually counted this encounter with the crossbar as a goal for fuck's 
sake. It's unforgivable for a football game to drop the ball on the fundamentals, but at least it's not completely broken and it does offer some playability and something different. Me, I'd have probably given it three stars. The incredible Crash Dummies was the culmination of a road safety campaign come toy line reaching the obvious conclusion of becoming a video game. Again, it's basically a set of mini games, all of which are requiring you to engage in extremely dangerous activities, such as diving suicidally from a building, skiing, whacking bombs with mallets, and that old classic, crashing a car. Complete each task with as much style as possible to earn money and move on to the next. It's really not that bad, although there's only so far a game about crash test dummies can take you before boredom sets in. The lacklustre gameplay is marred by a colour palette that would look more at home on the NES, and for a game that came out near the end of the Master System's life cycle, at least in Europe, they could have made something a bit more impressive looking, but it's obvious they were just phoning it in for this one. But does it deserve the dreaded one star rating? There's enough here to keep you interested for at least one playthrough, and it is actually playable. It's just a bit dull is all. Before turning to selling kitchen appliances, George Foreman was once a pro boxer, believe it or not. And so here's his obligatory licensed sports game. Well, not quite. George Foreman KO Boxing was previously known as James Buster Douglas KO Boxing. So in actuality, all poor George got was a recycled game. A recycled shit game to boot. It's every bit as bland and uninspiring as it looks, with muddy coloured graphics and dull looking sprites that move excruciatingly slowly and are painfully unresponsive. Enough said, it's an awful dud. I threw in the towel after one bout. To add insult to injury, later revisions of George Foreman KO Boxing were re-released under the title Heavyweight Champ after Sega lost the rights to use his name. Yeah, we all know Transbot was going to come up, and as you know, I particularly do like this one, and I vehemently disagree with its one star. Despite being utterly savaged by an ungrateful Sega power, more bot than trans indeed, this game has a bit of a cult following today, and is nowhere near as horrible as they made it out to be. It was a budget title, having been ported from the Sega card format, and if you ask me, I think Sega Power were often in the habit of just slating cheap games as shite offhand. Had they actually played it, they would have enjoyed it for what it actually is, a diverting little arcade style shoot 'em up Visually, it's attractive, though not very remarkable. The weapon selection is diverse and, despite its extremely limited scope, has plenty of replayability. Next! Renegade is a frightfully simple beat-em-up which, as an arcade title, laid the groundwork for Double Dragon. But this here 8-bit port arrived in 1993, well after Double Dragon hit the home consoles. So, by the time this turned up on Sega Power's desk, they'd seen it all before and it likely looked all too derivative by then, especially thanks to things like Streets of Rage. Not much to it really, but to stalk the mean streets, kicking and punching hordes of bad guys in the face, all in service of a wafer-thin plot about bringing down a crime syndicate or something. If you get beat up by the baddies, you'll eventually get chucked into a bin, which is hilarious. Unfortunately, to play the first level is to play the rest of the game, because it's utterly repetitive. It's basically the same roster of baddies, repeated ad nauseum through all the different levels. It does look nice though, but that's not enough to save it from mediocrity. Okay, so whoever gave this one a one-star review needs choke slamming. Seriously, this is by no means awful enough. It's a bit janky, yeah, with some iffy sound effects and graphics which hardly challenge the system's capabilities, but underneath all that is a pretty payable and amusing beat-em-up. The sprites are nicely animated and they control well. There's a decent roster of WWF stars from the time, including Hulk Hogan, of course, and Bret Hart and Randy Savage, but some of them are missing. However, they show up on the NES release, and vice versa. It was also the first home release to feature steel cage matches, so there. All wrestlers use the same movesets, and there are no special finishes, which is a disappointment, but this simplicity is what makes it playable, and it's really quite good fun, particularly when you're elbow dropping your opponents from the top of the cage. Worth one star? Absolutely not. 
And so that was Sega Power's Top of the Flops for the Master System. What did you make of it? Do you agree with their meagre ratings? Or did you think they were too harsh? Do you have any games in mind that should have been on that list? I'd be glad to hear from you in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please help me out by clicking like. And if you're feeling super awesome, consider subscribing to this channel for more videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Retro Respawn.